Most Batman villains are mentally unwell misfits lashing out at the world for some perceived injustice, but there's one significant villain that is arguably not insane. He's on a righteous crusade much like Batman. Similarly, he possesses incredible wealth amassed over several lifetimes and he uses that wealth to fund his mission to save the planet from the scourge of humanity. That man is the demon's head, Ra's al Ghul. Now, DCAU purists out there will be quick to chime in with... Father's name was pronounced Raish, not Raz. A common mistake. And that's a fair point. I completely agree that the DCAU version is pronounced Raish al Ghul. And of course, if someone tells you how to say their name and you deliberately mispronounce it, well, that makes you an unpleasant person. Respect others and their identities, please. However, the comic books clearly state that his name is Arabic for the demon's head. And while I'm no linguistic scholar, hell, I can barely pronounce English words correctly, I have been informed by three separate people, all native Arabic speakers, that the demon's head in Arabic is Raz al Ghul. Interestingly, two of the three told me that Raish al Ghul sounds like the Hebrew for Head of the Demon, which I suppose would make the DCAU Raish al Ghul canonically Jewish? Either way, it's generally a minor point, and I think that the ambiguity around his name adds to the mystery of the character's origins. So, in my mind, the comic book version is named Raz al Ghul, while the DCAU version is named Raish al Ghul. Although one other point of contention, at least according to one of my Arabic speaking friends, is that demon isn't exactly the best translation for ghouls. She told me that beast or monster would be a better translation, but I think that's probably an argument for another day. On to the character's comic book origins. It may surprise you to learn that Raz al Ghul is a relatively recent creation in the comics. He made his first appearance in Batman 232 in 1971. In my mind, that's only about 30 years ago, but in reality it's over 50, which has spawned an existential crisis, fearing the passage of time as we all hurtle down the path towards becoming nothing but dust. During the 20 years between his first appearance and the launch of Batman the Animated Series, Ra's al Ghul only appeared in about a dozen comics. He was primarily used as the villain responsible for large-scale, world-threatening events, which was relatively new territory for Batman at the time. You have to remember that this was barely five years after the end of the campy 1960s Adam West starring TV show had ended, and Batman's comic book adventures were just starting to come out of that comical period, instead latching onto the then popular trend of horror comics. During this era, Batman would face werewolves, ghosts and man bats in horrific science gone wrong stories. Ra's al Ghul is entirely representative of the new era of Batman, brought about by writer Denny O'Neill and artist Neil Adams, with dynamic globe-trotting adventures taking inspiration from the James Bond movies that were very popular at the time, with a droplet of horror mixed in. Ra's al Ghul is, of course, an assumed name. His real name is lost to the sands of time, and he is the head of a massive criminal empire. He was once a physician and used his knowledge of medicine and biological warfare to attempt to control the human population and bring balance back to nature. One of his key features is the fact that he is able to resurrect himself using a mystical pool of liquid called a Lazarus Pit. Initially, the comics said that the pit would only work for him, but over time it was shown to work on anyone, so long as they were either dead or at the point of death. Bathing in the toxic waters while healthy would lead to a painful death. As a result of these pits, Raz has been alive for hundreds of years and has usually been involved in some way or another in some of the biggest events in human history. While Raz's origins wouldn't be revealed until 1993's The Birth of the Demon graphic novel written by Denny O'Neill and painted by the legendary Norm Brayfogle, it's clear that O'Neill had put a lot of thought into the character's background even in the 70s. Raz has roots as a physician or a healer and while he cares a great deal about the world, he takes a cold clinical approach to its problems. He views much of humanity as a cancer, draining the resources, polluting the air, and ruining the planet. His solution is to remove them in an effort to restore balance. And as hard as it is to say, he is kind of right. It's just that he goes about achieving his aims through murder, espionage, and deception. It just isn't right. So we have a mysterious man operating under a scary code name. He likes to wear a cape and uses his tremendous wealth and resources to pursue his mission of saving the world. Does that sound like someone else we know? It's probably not too surprising then that Raz would identify Batman as a suitable heir. He sees a lot of himself in him, even if he thinks that Batman's respect for human life is a bit naive. Batman and Raz are very much alike, even if Batman operates on a smaller scale, trying to save Gotham City rather than the entire world. And it also helps that his daughter Talia is attracted to him. It's interesting to note that Batman's father was also a physician, although by most accounts he was far more kind and compassionate. 
Raz and Talia would appear in some large-scale multi-part storylines over the years. In their first story, Batman would interfere in Raz's plans, culminating in the famous Desert Duel stripped to the waist. Batman would win the battle after being poisoned by a scorpion sting and having the antidote delivered to him covertly by a kiss from Talia. After his capture, Raz would fake his own death at the hands of Batman to allow himself to escape from prison, but he also hoped to persuade Batman to reconsider his offer to take over his empire. The logic being that now that the world thought he was a murderer and the police had sworn to bring him in, it might be a bit more palatable to go through with Raz's plans. Of course, Batman uncovered the plot and proved his innocence. One of the most significant things that Raz did in this era was orchestrate the murder of Kathy Kane, the original 1950s Batwoman. This character had been retired following the end of the campy sci-fi era of Batman comics, but having her return only to be murdered by the henchman of the villain that was representative of this new era of Batman comics was pretty symbolic. Not subtle symbolism by any means, but symbolic nonetheless. Eventually, Raz would capture Batman, drug him, and then marry him to Talia while he was unconscious. Apparently, in their culture, the only consent for marriage to take place is that of the bride. Despite the marriage, which is 100% legally binding, nothing anyone can do about it, I'm sure, Batman would still resist Raz. One of the key defining traits of Raz is that he's always returned, despite having some pretty definitive deaths. First he was flattened when his base was destroyed by an earthquake, then a few years later he would reappear and seemingly meet his end after taking an unnecessary dunk in the Lazarus pit before his island base was destroyed in a volcanic eruption. Raz would return one more time before Crisis on Infinite Earths reset the continuity in Batman 400. In this story, Raz would break all of Batman's villains out of Arkham Asylum and command them to attack Batman and his allies. Raz would offer to recapture the villains and ensure that they remain locked up forever so long as Batman swore to join his cause. Of course, Batman would refuse, and with the help of his allies Robin, Catwoman, and Talia, he would defeat every single one of his enemies and send them back to Arkham. He would confront Raz, flinging him headfirst into the Lazarus Pit as his underground base came crashing down around them. It's interesting to note that a similar scheme would take place during the Nightfall crossover of the 90s, where Bane blows up Arkham Asylum in an effort to physically weaken Batman before he breaks his back. After Crisis, Raz would remain much the same, although certain events, like the claim that his Lazarus pit would only work for him, were swept away. However, one thing of note is that he would star in a series of hardcover graphic novels, starting with 1987's Son of the Demon, 1990's Bride of the Demon, and the aforementioned Birth of the Demon. Original hardcover comic books weren't a common thing from American comic book publishers in the 80s, so it says something about how they viewed Raz the star of large-scale stories, special events that could only be published as original, one-off, hardcover comic books. The canonicity of these books, specifically Son of the Demon, which sees Batman temporarily joining Ra's al Ghul's empire, and Bride of the Demon, in which Ra's takes on a new wife, is a bit murky, but they're still worth a read. Birth of a Demon is unquestionably canon, and it's by far the best of the three, as the events of the book have been referenced multiple times throughout the DC Universe, and it gives us the definitive origin of the man who would become Ra's al Ghul. A young physician from a tribe of nomads, he was betrayed after the prince took a dip in the Lazarus pit and murdered Ra's wife in a friend Raz was blamed for her death and cruelly cast into a hole with his wife's corpse and left to die. Upon being rescued, Raz returned to his tribe and planned revenge on those that had betrayed him. With his victory complete and a trip to the Lazarus Pit of his own, Raz declared himself the demon's head, ordered the written history of his people be destroyed and set off for new lands. So this brings us to the early 90s, when Batman the Animated Series was in development. One of the first things that producer Bruce Timm did was to rope in comic book artists to help design some of the characters. Included in Kevin Nolan's original batch of character designs are these two drawings of Ra's al Ghul, making it clear that the BTAS team really wanted to utilize more obscure characters from the get-go. Famously, director Kevin Altieri only agreed to join the project on the condition that he would get to direct the Ra's al Ghul episodes, as he was a massive fan of the character from his childhood. He would go on to direct all five episodes of BTAS that featured Raish al Ghul. With the setup out of the way, let's talk about how they interpreted the character. So the BTAS version of Raish al Ghul is incredibly faithful to the comic book version, so much so that when editor Martin Pascoe attempted to rewrite the script for Raish's introductory episode, The Demon's Quest, Kevin Altieri insisted that they ignore the majority of the revisions and stick to the original script, written by Denny O'Neill, the character's creator. It's clear that Raish was a very important character to them and they wanted to do him right. While The Demon's Quest is the first story to focus on Raish, he does make a brief cameo appearance at the end of Off Balance. Raish has sent his daughter Talia to recover a sonic weapon from Count Vertigo, but Batman sabotages it, effectively defanging Raish's plans. We don't see much of Raish during his appearance, he stands with his back to the camera for the majority of the screen time before turning around and uttering, As you said, Detective, 
this is not over. Talk about foreshadowing. The next big Ra's al Ghul story is The Demon's Quest, a two-part story that retains a lot of the same material from the initial Ra's al Ghul storyline from the comics, although there are some differences. For instance, Raish's plan is much more global and he has a far larger army at his disposal. This faithfulness to the comics means that we get a story that is tonally very different from the rest of the animated series. Traditionally, Betas's stories were about broken people lashing out at society and effectively Batman trying to calm them down. Raish, however, possesses a threat to the entire world. And as such, the world of BTAS becomes a lot bigger with trips to Calcutta, the Himalayas and the Sahara Desert. One of the key things that tells us this story is not like other episodes is that part one has a cold open where we see Robin on a stormy night heading back to his dorm room. The traditional title card doesn't appear until about a minute into the episode and even then the title card is part of the background with the text appearing over the bridge to the Batcave before it lowers. Another rare thing occurs within the first few minutes we see Batman with his cowl off. The creators of the show very deliberately avoided showing Bruce Wayne's face when he wore the costume to help drive home the idea that Batman and Bruce Wayne were so different that they were almost two separate people. So we see him without his cowl on and Ra's al Ghul just casually walks into the Batcave, one of the most secure and secret locations on Earth, catching Batman at his most vulnerable. For fans of the character, this two-parter must have been a thrill as it's one of the most faithful adaptations of a Batman comic. But for me, someone who prefers Batman working on a more grounded, small-scale, personal level, eh, it's just okay. The next Ra's al Ghul episode, Avatar, is another international adventure, but this time with a very different tone. One of horror. Ra's al Ghul has returned after his dunk in the Lazarus Pit, and Batman teams up with Talia to find him. It's revealed that Ra's is on a quest to unearth a legendary Egyptian queen, Tothkapera who apparently knew the secret to eternal life. This episode is an ode to classic Hammer horror films from its opening flashback showing an explorer who strongly resembles Peter Cushing being killed while searching for Thothkapera to the reveal of the zombie queen. She presents herself as a beautiful woman and seeks only to share her knowledge by joining with Raish. It quickly becomes apparent that her secret of eternal life involves draining the life of others. This is a very cool episode. I particularly like the colour scheme of the final act with rich browns and oranges in stark contrast with the gloopy green of Tothkapera. Although the final scene where Talia betrays Batman and frees her father, thus proving her loyalty to him, was a twist that we could see coming a million miles away. Raish's final appearance in BTAS comes in the episode Showdown, and this is my favourite Ra's al Ghul episode by a long shot. Again, it is tonally very different. While Demon's Quest was a James Bond-style international adventure and Avatar was a thrilling horror story, Showdown takes us to uncharted territory, the Old West. After Raish breaks into a nursing home and leaves Batman a tape, we are taken back to the days of the Great Expansion West and meet the legendary bounty hunter Jonah Hex. He's in his twilight years and seeks one Arcady Duval. Duval has a history of brutalizing women and Hex has tracked him down over 12 states in order to bring him to justice and collect the $200 reward. Duval's an interesting character because his character model was based on actor Malcolm McDowell's character Harry Flashman in the film Royal Flash. They were actually able to get McDowell to play the role of Duval, kickstarting McDowell's career as a voice actor. DCAU fans may recognise him as the voice of John Corbin, also known as Metallo, in Superman the Animated Series. Now this is my favourite Ra's al Ghul episode because it's more down to earth. It's a story about a broken down, jaded bounty hunter who usually shoots firsts and asks questions later tracking down the embodiment of privilege in Duval, a man who does as he likes with women and is cruel towards those he deems to be lesser than him, and Hex ensures that justice is delivered. Once upon a time, Hex would have just shot Duval and be done with it, but in his old age he sees imprisonment as a more fitting punishment. Plus, it's easier than lugging a corpse to the nearest sheriff. The twist in the tale is that Duval is Ra's al Ghul's son, and after the events of the flashback, Raish lost track of him for almost a hundred years. After finally learning that his son was still alive and rotting away in some Gotham City nursing home, Raish did what any father would do. He went and got his son. It's a sign of Batman's compassion, allowing an international criminal to collect his elderly invalid son and leave without a struggle. If Batman followed the letter of the law, he would have attempted to arrest Raish, but he understands that sometimes rules need to be broken. 
Outside of BTAS, Raish would make two significant appearances in two other DCAU shows. Firstly, in the Superman episode The Demon Reborn, it was revealed that the Lazarus Pits are no longer as potent as they once were, and Raish is close to death. Using a magical staff, Raish and Talia seek to sap Superman's strength and give it to Raish, turning him into a hulking brute and feeding his appetite for power. When his access to power is at risk, we see him lash out at everyone, including his beloved daughter Talia, showing how the power has corrupted him. The climax of the episode ends with Raish tumbling over the edge of a cliff after attempting to save Talia. The two fall into the water below. His next on-screen appearance takes place in the Batman Beyond era, but before we cover that, it's worth looking at some of his DCAU comic book appearances. In these comics, Raish al Ghul was used sparingly. Arguably, his most prominent appearance was Batman Adventures Annual 2, which was a collaboration between Bruce Timm, Paul Dini, and Glenn Murakami. All familiar names from the show. This comic introduces the demon to the DCAU. Raish al Ghul uses a stone tablet to summon a demon to Gotham City, but Batman brings in a demon of his own, one that is very familiar with Raish, to help stop his scheme. Raish makes several other appearances, including Batman and Robin Adventures 25, where Raish gets abducted by aliens and steals their flying saucer. No, no, trust me, it, it sounds silly, yes, but it's a good comic, I promise. However, there are two substantial stories that I have to talk about. The first big storyline in Batman Adventures Volume 2 revolves around Raish realising the Batman's devotion to his mission to protect Gotham from crime is the real impediment to getting him to take over the League of Shadows. So Raish decides to help Batman by assassinating all of the villains in Arkham Asylum. Of course Batman is completely against this scheme, no matter how logical it might sound. And for the very first time, we see Raish taken into custody. Now the next segment contains spoilers for the recently concluded Batman Adventures Continue, so if you haven't read them and plan on doing so, skip this chapter. Last call for Spoiler Town. In Batman Adventures Continue 6 through 8, Raish and Talia approach Batman once more in an attempt to win him over. Now nearing the end of his life, where even the power of the Lazarus Pits is toxic to him, Raish is desperate for Batman to take over for him. In order to prove his sincerity, he has committed all of his resources to solving world hunger. He's produced a genetically modified crop that can grow in any conditions and can be manipulated to resemble any food. However, as you might expect with Raish al Ghul, things are not what they seem. This miracle grain has been genetically modified to eventually render people sterile within a few generations. It's actually quite a smart plan by Raish. He realizes that Batman has a problem with murder and would stop any violent scheme of his that involve killing people. His new plan, Raish argues, is much more humane. Prevent the majority of people from being able to reproduce, only allowing those that they deem worthy of being able to have children. But who decides who's worthy? And how do they determine it? It all sounds too much like an authoritarian nightmare, and there's no way Batman would be on board with it. Similarly, Raish revisits the idea of solving Batman's mission by dealing with his foes. Although this time, rather than killing them, he locks them up in an inescapable prison guarded by the Talons from the Court of Owls. These inhumane and cruel conditions are too much for Batman. Compassion is one of his core principles, and he cannot stand to see his enemies treated this way. When Batman rejects the offer again, Raish orders the execution of the villains and an all-out brawl between Batman, joined by his enemies, and Raish al Ghul and the Talons kicks off. This whole section is reminiscent of that story from Batman 400, except in this case, all of Batman's foes are teaming up with him, as well as Talia, Robin and Catwoman, to defeat Raish. The last time we see this decrepit Raish al Ghul, he dives into the Lazarus Pit, despite knowing it could be toxic to him, in the mistaken belief that it will revitalize him once more. I think this callback to Batman 400 is representative of the end of another era. DC Comics have apparently ended Batman Adventures Continue, if Ty Templeton's Facebook is anything to go by, and they will not be bringing it back for a fourth season. With the death of Kevin Conroy, we are highly unlikely to ever see the proposed BTAS continuation podcast that was announced a few years ago. So really, this story is presented to us as the end of Batman the Animated Series and the DC Animated Universe. Of course, things could change, you never know. Despite appearing to meet his end, Raish's body mysteriously disappears, leaving open the possibility of a return. A return we'll discuss in my next video, where we delve into the story of the daughter of the demon, Talia al Ghul.